30 years ago, uh, the party of no new ideas was uh, promoting their trickle-down fairy tale. It's come back around of late, and it hasn't succeeded much at all. For all the tax cuts of the 1980s, we haven't seen any change for the better for the working class. If anything, things have gotten demonstrably worse. So they've resorted to things like hate to divide us. But we're not going to talk about hate. One of, the childhood, one of my childhood heroes was a man who said that hate does not drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so last night at the event with Representative Ellison, I spoke to uh, several of the UVM Democrats. And I said, what is it that you'd like for me to address this morning? And they said, we want to hear about how we can get involved. Well, you've already done the first part. You've showed up here today. And for that, I thank you enormously. The next thing is that same man that told us that we cannot resort to hate, that love is the answer, told us that it's reasonable to expect a man or a woman to pull themselves up by their boots, but it's a cruel jest, a cruel jest, to expect a man or a woman to pull themselves up by their bootstraps when they have no boots. So what I'm here today to do is to ask you to join with me in ensuring that all Vermonters have boots. And I don't think, I don't think you know, it, it dawned on me many years later after my service that um, I had to sign up to sacrifice, be willing to sacrifice my life to get a college education, as have, as have millions of other of Americans. And to me, that is absolutely unacceptable. For me, it was my only way out. And we still live in an economy that preys upon that notion that unless you're born on third base, you're going to have to sign up for the US military to get an education. Not acceptable. Totally unacceptable. We need to be ensuring that all people, first here in Vermont, have boots. And that means access to health care. That means access to quality education, both um, prior to grade school and beyond high school. And it means ensuring people have a safe and clean environment to work in, rather than the current economy that depends upon poisoning the environment so it can profit. But no one person is going to do this by themselves. Certainly not me. Being a governor is about bringing together a team of shared values. And if you share these values with me in ensuring that all people have an opportunity to pull themselves up by their bootstraps by first ensuring they have boots, then we win. Because government is of the people, by the people, for the people. We are the people. Don't ever forget that. Show up. Be the change that you want to see in this world. That's why I'm running, because I couldn't sit by any longer after that election as someone who served my country once to sit on the sidelines to watch what that philosophy, that philosophy of exploitation, was doing to America. And it's happening here in Vermont as well. So I ask you, if you haven't, Get yourself a copy of the Vermont Democratic Party platform. Read it. If you're not a Democrat after you've read this, we got problems. There's not a single person who reads this that should not want to be a proud Vermont Democrat. So thank you. Thank you for showing up. We're going to need your help on the campaign. Uh, my campaign manager is here, Theo Fetter. My last name is kind of hard to spell. E-H-L-E-R-S. Find us on Facebook, and together we'll be the change together. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Ellers. Uh, my name is Karina Filiuzzi. I'm the treasurer for the UVM College Democrats. And I'm excited to be introducing to you four of Vermont's uh, elected, official, elected officials who work every day to protect and empower Vermonters. First, we're going to hear from Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. He began his political career right here at UVM while still a student and went on to serve 14 years in Vermont State House before becoming Lieutenant Governor, where he focuses on youth initiatives, supporting our rural economy, protecting the environment, boosting wages, improving working conditions, and easing property taxes. Please help me welcome Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. Thank you for coming out today. It's, uh, the weather seems to have suddenly changed. Apparently there's no such thing as climate change and we're all gonna be okay, <laughs> right? Let me tell you, um, that's not true. Uh, obviously. Um, as a farmer who experiences the weather we've had this year from the uh, nonstop rain of June and July, uh, then the fairly nonstop dry from August, September, and October that were quite abnormally warm, uh, the impacts are now fully in effect. Uh, the ability to grow food is changing. Uh, if people don't think climate change is real, you got another thing coming. If you think having a safe, reliable food supply is important, if you think having water is important, if you think living in places that suffer the consequences of hurricanes where they still have no power six and eight weeks after hurricanes Irma and Maria and uh, the like is important, then you have to be involved. You have to be involved beyond just elections. Voting is critically important. A recent survey that just came out said 1% of the folks that voted for Hillary regret it, 2% of the folks that voted for Donald Trump regret it, and 18% of the people that didn't vote regret it. So voting is critically important, and hopefully those people that haven't voted or weren't able to vote yet will participate and will vote moving forward, but more importantly, more importantly, is to continue to be involved between the elections. Coming out to events like this is a part of that. Learning information that you can use to talk with your colleagues and friends and folks that you disagree with in a civil, respectful manner. To talk about what is happening in our democracy is important between the elections. Calling your legislator. How many people here know who their local Vermont legislator is? Raise your hand. Right? Brian's right here. But the point is, the point, the point is knowing who he is and giving him your thoughts, whether you support some things or you're opposed to some things or you just have information that he doesn't have is important. The same is true with me as your lieutenant governor, our governor, Phil Scott, who's the present governor, all of the folks who represent you in the other offices in the state. Participating by reading newspaper stories or online and participating in the comments. You know, the media pays attention to what's liked and not liked. That shapes the discussion that is being had by politicians. So I ask you, do you, who here has a hobby that you do two or three times a week for half an hour or an hour? Something you do regularly, you might read a book, you might go jogging, you might uh, hang out with friends at certain times. Pretty much everybody, you've got a few hours you do that every week, right? So I ask you, how many people here spend 15 minutes a week participating in democracy? Please raise your hand. Thank you. I want to thank those people. And I want to say to the rest who are here today, yes, this is your 15 minutes. In fact, it's an hour or so, so you might even call this four weeks worth of your participation. <laughs> but, but, can you commit to 15 minutes a week? We are incredibly privileged in this room. We're sitting in a university setting. Many of you are either here at the university studying or have had the opportunity to get an education through higher education and are here today. Some certainly may not have, but I would hazard safely, I think, that the vast majority have. We are phenomenally privileged. And when we're looking at what's happening in Washington right now with the discussion about repealing the estate tax, and the discussion about meritocracy. Who knows what meritocracy means? Okay, so meritocracy is 
everybody can get to wherever they can get based on how hard they work and how hard they work to get there. That's the Republican meme right now. And in repealing the estate tax, what they're saying is, by the way, those folks that have a lot of wealth, they all earned every penny of it. Just like everybody here who's going to get everywhere you get in life, all based on your own work. And that's a beautiful image, but it's not reality. It is not reality. Most people are where you're at based on decisions that were completely out of your control. The family you were born into, the household you grew up in, the educational opportunity you have is certainly partly from your hard work in high school and the grades you got. But also, if you're in a stable home, do you know that 70% of white Americans own their homes, but only about 50% of people of color? Why is that? Because government policy in the 50s and 60s subsidized home ownership loans, but they were not granted equally. And those folks that come from places where you own the home, that's part of the wealth and the wealth gap that exists. And the opportunity to go to college is greater. The opportunity to get a, a job out of college is greater when you can do internships because you don't have to work while you're in college to pay your bills. Or if you come out of college with much less debt than some people who are coming out with $100,000 of debt, your circumstances are very different if you have to work 20 hours a week while you're in college than if you don't have to work 20 hours a week while you're in college. All of these things flow from the wealth circumstances often that each of us are born into. And it's different for everybody. And there's no reason to feel guilty for it, but it's important to recognize it. And the question is, as government, what are we doing? We, all of us here, not just those of us elected, what are we doing to make sure everybody has the same opportunity that some people have had in our culture and others have not? And when they repeal the estate tax, and don't put funding into educational opportunities, and don't put funding into making it possible for people to heat their homes enough that they're not shivering while trying to do their homework, if they even have um, parents that are encouraging them to do the homework in the first place. If we don't have resources to extend broadband into rural areas where a lot of working class people don't have access to the internet, then we are cutting short those economic opportunities, and we are not actually starting at a level playing field the way the Republicans would like us to think. So your involvement and your privilege of being here and my privilege to serve also bears with it responsibility. And that responsibility is to make sure everybody has an equal opportunity. So I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for each of you, anytime you want to call my office and share with me information and knowledge, share with me your opinion or your position, and share with your legislators your support for the ideas that you think are important. I want to thank you for that. So thank you for being here today. I look forward to hearing from the other speakers, and especially, of course, Keith Ellison, who I did support to be chair of the Democratic National Committee. And that's what we needed, and we still need to move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman. Up next, I'm excited to introduce Vermont's Secretary of State, Jim Condos. Uh, Jim Condos is a UVM alum with over 30 years of business experience gained working in a variety of diverse companies, from a global Fortune 100 to a Vermont-based, family-owned grocery distribution company. Mr. Condos has a unique and comprehensive understanding of Vermont's business needs. Since he was elected in 2010, Secretary Condos has worked tirelessly to bring greater transparency to all levels of government. Please help me introduce Secretary of State Jim Condos. Thank you. And I want to say that it is great to see you all here. It is great to see you getting politically engaged and involved. I think David and, and others have spoken about getting involved, and it is important. Unfortunately, not a lot, lot of young people are as motivated to get involved politically across the country right now, which makes the work you're doing even more important. As, excuse me. I was first elected to Secretary of State in 2010, serving eight years, after serving eight years in the State Senate and I served 18 years on the South Burlington City Council. 
During my time as an elected official, and since I've been interested in politics, starting with my time here at UVM, I've always believed that the right to vote is fundamental and a constitutionally protected right. The truth is, today, our voting rights are under attack. In the last seven years, we have seen a national movement to suppress the vote, unprecedented in U.S. history. If you go back to the, the, when this country was founded, when the only people that could vote then were white male landowners, and since that time, we've had at least 10 instances where uh, constitutional amendments or acts of law have been passed, it's always been about expanding the right to vote. Today, what we're seeing is going the other way. In the last seven years, more, almost 40 states have had laws introduced in their legislatures that will in some way impact Americans' right to vote. What we've seen, partisan gerrymandering of electoral districts to ensure that certain people are elected, discriminatory voter ID laws, aggressive voter roll purging, removal of same-day voter registration and early voting. In fact, a lot of the conservatives these days are even going after absentee voting, saying that that should be eliminated. But let's remember one point. The right to vote, the right to vote is the bedrock of our democracy. The real voter fraud that's occurring around this country today, the real voter fraud is preventing otherwise eligible Americans from casting a ballot. Today, our fight for voter rights is far from over. At this very moment, the President continues to use his baseless claim that he lost the popular vote last November because three to five million illegal votes were cast in that election. A claim he makes, by the way, with no evidence, and a claim which both Republican and Democratic election officials across the country have denied, have said had, did not exist. Folks, we have a hard enough time getting people to vote once, never mind twice. <laughs> Yet today he uses this claim to justify the work of his so-called Election Integrity Commission, which he, in, in, uh, he, he uh, put a co-chair in, one of, my former, or one of my colleagues, the Kansas Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, who's known for voter suppression. From the very beginning, I said this commission was a sham, and that its true purpose is to champion the President's false and baseless claims of voter fraud in order to aggressively pursue an agenda of suppressing the vote. Just yesterday, a member of that commission, the Democratic member of that commission, and the, there are only four, I think, Democrats out of 12 uh, positions on that committee, Maine Secretary of State Matt Dunlap, a friend of mine, filed a lawsuit against the commission that he sits on. He filed a lawsuit because there's a lack of transparency from that, that commission, the presidential commission. Today, I'm also proud to say that here in Vermont, we've moved completely in the opposite direction. Over the last 10 years, we've expanded access to the ballot box for eligible voters. We added online voter registration same-day voter registration was enacted just this year. Automatic voter registration, where we take your information from the DMV and automatically register you to vote. Expanded early vote in 2009 when, when the overseas and military vote was cast. We, uh, we actually had a 30-day early vote period. We extended it to 45 at that time. And in 2010, we had a constitutional amendment that overwhelmingly passed here in Vermont that allows 17-year-olds to vote in primaries if they will be 18 by the general election. Why shouldn't a 17-year-old who's going to get to vote on Election Day have a right to help elect the people that they will see on their ballot? Expanding access to our democratic process without widespread voter fraud, what a concept. As the incoming president-elect, and I will take it, uh, over as the president next July of the National Association of Secretaries of State, I will continue to push back 
against voter suppression and encourage other states to look at Vermont as an example of democracy. But we need your help. How we move on voting, how we move on voting rights and, and the direction of this country over the next few years will impact every single one of us. We need you to get involved, to register to vote. And there's folks out front that are registering people. Show up to vote. You can actually, by the way, you can actually register to vote on this now. Um, we need you to work on campaigns. We need you to work for candidates and, we, and for issues. And we need you to run for office. Yes, we need you to run for office. The first step you can take to protect our right to vote is to exercise that right. So thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us take a stand to protect our democracy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary Condos. Next, I'm excited to introduce Vermont State Treasurer Beth Pierce. Treasurer Pierce has over 40 years of experience in government finance at both the state and local levels. She's an advocate for conservative, affordable debt prices, prudent management of the pension systems, and responsible use of reserves. Treasurer Pierce serves as a senior vice president of the National Association of State Treasurers, and she was elected this October to serve as their president. Please help me welcome Secretary Pierce. Let's give Karina a hand. She's doing a great job, right? Come on. All right. It takes a lot of work to get this done, and I really want to thank the people who did, did that, and, and thank you very much for being here on a nice crisp fall day, and I love it. So, hey, I, I, you know, I, I'm not a real fan of those hot, humid days. I, this is why we're here in Vermont. It's just great, and hopefully the ski season will be just as good. First, I want to say uh, thank you to, uh, to my, my fellow uh, constitutional officers. I want to say thank you very much for standing up for people, for doing the right thing. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor, for what you do to stand up for people every single day. Let's give him a hand as well. And Jim is talking about voting rights, and it's fundamental. The right to vote, we take it for granted sometimes, but when we see the, 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 the assault on basic rights uh, for all of us, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's, and I just want to say thank you very much for Jim for standing up and doing the right thing there. And it's tough. I mean, it, the, the folks that are uh, Secretary of States across the country do not all share his view. And uh, it's a tough fight, but I'm glad he's there to take that fight. So thank you very much, Jim. And TJ is going to talk, TJ Donovan is going to talk after me about social justice and what we've done there, and it's so important. And I look at things, I'm a treasurer, okay, so I'm a little bit of a geek, okay, I'm a treasurer, and I talk a lot about economic justice and, and, and the right for every single citizen, every single Vermonter, every single person in this country should have an opportunity for a lifetime of financial well-being. That is fundamental, and we need to take the policies at the, the state level and the national level to make that happen for every single citizen. No. In Vermont, you know, I, I've been doing finance work. I'm not much of a politician. I've been doing finance work for 40 some odd years. That's showing you my age too. But uh, the bottom line for me is the bottom line. You know, I look at it, I look at it every day and I look at the, the finances of the state and I see a bottom line that, uh, and, and I'm worried about it, to be very honest. We need to take a look at our fundamental expenditures and our revenues and how we manage that for the sake of all of our citizens. But the biggest question for me is how does that bottom line serve every single Vermonter? Not just a few elite, but every single Vermonter needs a share in that bottom line. And we do that by making sure that we protect every single Vermonter through social justice, through economic justice, for making sure that everyone has the right to vote, to work together through financial literacy programs so that people understand how to save for the future. Right now in this state, there are 104,000 Vermonters who are working who do not have access to employer-sponsored retirement plans. And you say, well, I'm not thinking about that right now. I'm in school. But you will be working. 
and, and some of you are working now, and some of you are working to get through school, and I commend you for all that. The bottom line is with the end of their life, after hard years of work, after participating in the economy, after being good citizens, they should have adequate and reliable income in retirement. And when you don't have vehicles to let them have a retirement program, you don't have that. Okay, every single person should have dignity in retirement, and it's also good for the state. It's good for the individual, but when the person has adequate and reliable income, they buy goods and services, that helps create jobs. So in partnership, we should see a broader view that what we do to help individuals is good for the economy, it's good for Vermont, instead of this narrow view that we've got to squeeze the bottom line and, 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 and cut, cut, cut. It has to be a balanced approach that says every citizen and should share in that economic prosperity. <laughs> Working with the legislature, we came up with a plan on that 104,000, and I do appreciate the work that they've done, and we're going to be doing something about that. The other area that the Treasury gets to work on is retirement systems for state employees, municipal employees, your teachers, all of you folks that in Vermont, your teachers on our retirement plan. And they, too, after a long period of public service, should have a right to dignity in retirement, not being on public assistance to, 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 to manage their bills. I was at a teacher uh, seminar a few years ago, and the speaker before me was explaining to elderly teachers how to apply for food stamps. They taught you. They, came, they, they, they spent their life educating citizens, and it is an absolute travesty that we put people in that position. It's an absolute travesty that we put any person in that position. But the bottom line for me is that we need to continue to have our retirement programs, need to, uh, to manage those responsibly for the taxpayer, but also make sure that every single person is entitled to a life of dignity. I see across the country all these efforts to cut plans, these efforts to say that we can't afford these plans, and that is just plain wrong. We're not going to let that happen in Vermont, right? Okay. The last part of how we serve this is in local investment. You know, I, I'm a treasurer and I work with financial people across the country and I do work with banks, I do work with investment folks, but what we said is let's put some of this money here, let's take the money out of Wall Street and let's put 10% of our dollars into Vermont and do, uh, and do good things with that and earn a good income and interest for the state. And we were able to do that, we had a lot of help doing that, a representative Botso in the, uh, in the Commerce and Economic Committee uh, 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 a, a lot of folks helped us along the way, um, and I was so grateful for the help um, all, you know, from, from Senator Polina on this. We got this done, and now we put 10 percent in, and, and basically it's in housing and energy, helping lower the cost of education. We worked with VSAC to lower the rates on the interest rates that they have for loans. I don't like loans at all. You probably don't like them either, but the bottom line is lowering the interest rate was a good thing. And, and into and transportation as well, and, and other things, working landscape. We, we've done a program to help farmers. We've done a program to, uh, to help with daycare centers. You know, I was up in a parade a few years ago, and uh, the, in front of me was a float with a child care uh, daycare center, and the kids were hopping all over the place, and frankly, I was glad somebody else was watching them instead of me, okay? But we gave them the loan through the Vermont Community Loan Fund to have that. And we can all do what we do. I'm a geek. I like, I like uh, economics. I like finance. But we can take that and turn it into helping people. And as you go in your careers, whatever you do, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a finance person, whether, whether you're a political science major, you can be part of that solution. And I encourage you and I challenge you to continue to do that and work through your careers. I also want to say, by the way, we're in the Ira, uh, Ira Allen what are we calling this, the uh, Ira Allen? Chapel, Chapel, thank you, I should have picked up Chapel. Ira Allen, by the way, was the first treasurer of Vermont, so I just want to put a little history on that. Bottom line is every single person 
can be a part of the solution. I challenge you to do that. I thank you for being here because being here means that you already want to be part of that. And thank you very much for what you're doing. I want to thank my fellow uh, elective officers for what they're doing to help Vermont move forward in a way that says every single person is involved in the solution and every single person shares in the gains that we make in terms of our environment, in terms of our economics, and in terms of social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Treasurer Pierce. Up next, I'm excited to introduce Vermont's Attorney General, T.J. Donovan. T.J. Donovan was elected Attorney General of the State of Vermont in November 2016 after serving as Chittenden County State Attorney. Mr. Donovan started the award-winning criminal justice program, Rapid Intervention Community Court, which is available to nonviolent offenders whose crimes have been driven by addic addiction or mental illness. He was co-chair for government Peter Shumlin's criminal justice and substance abuse cabinet. Please help me welcome Vermont's Attorney General T.J. Donovan. Good morning. I want to first acknowledge on this day before we recognize Veterans Day, uh, all veterans who have, and their families uh, who have served our country uh, who have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, to those that uh, are members of families who have had those who have served, I say thank you, uh, to those who perhaps are currently uh, serving our country, I thank you for your service. But we have an obligation uh, as Vermonters and as Americans uh, to take care of those veterans when they come home. And you talk about these issues of mental illness, you talk about the issues of trauma, you talk about the issues of homelessness. No veteran who has served our country should be homeless. No veteran who has served our country should not have access to care. And certainly no veteran who has served our country should end up in a jail cell because of the trauma they suffered in service to this country. And when we, talk, when we talk about taking care of our veterans, we should be talking about taking care of all Americans and all Vermonters. And in this country where we're engaged in a debate where the very fundamental basis of the founding of our country, respect, civility, diversity, is at stake, we have an obligation to speak up and for those who are being oppressed. And as Attorney General in this state, I can tell you quite simply this. It does not matter who you love. It does not matter whom you worship. It does not matter who you're from, where you're from. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter how you identify. The state of Vermont respects you, and more importantly, the state of Vermont will protect you and your civil rights. And we've done it, whether it's been taking legal action to protect folks that have tried to come to this country. We talk about what's going on in this country. We have to talk about the history of this country. This is a country based on immigration. This is a city and a state built on immigration. Immigrants are good for our country. Immigrants are good for our economy. And we cannot forget our history, and we can't forget our own personal history, and we have to stand in solidarity of all those that seek to come to this country for one simple reason, to seek a better life. That is the American dream, that's, at, that's what's at stake, and that's what we're fighting to preserve. We also have to speak up in order to protect our environment. Everybody has a fundamental right to clean air and to clean water and pollution doesn't know any state borders. And as Attorney General, we have fought vigorously to make sure that in the proudest of Vermont traditions, we have protect our water, our air, our landscape, because that is the protection of our people, 
of our state and our country, that climate change is real, and that we have to speak out against it and make sure that we stand up against the dismantling of these protections at the federal level because it's gonna impact here, us, at the, at the local level. And when we talk about protecting the most vulnerable, we should talk about this issue of poverty. You know, as Karina said in her introduction, my previous job was as state's attorney, criminal prosecutor. And while the criminal justice system should reflect the general population, we know that it does not. Because if you went into any court or you went into any jail in this state, what you would see are two types of people, the poor and increasingly people of color in Vermont and across this nation. People of color perhaps make up one to 2% of our general population in this state, but they represent 10% of our incarcerated population. And when you talk about the issue of poverty, I don't know, the poor don't have a monopoly on committing crime, but we have to ask ourselves, why is it they overwhelmingly represent the incarcerated population? We have to talk about the issues of mental illness. We have to talk about the issues of addiction. We have to talk about the issues of racism. They're real, and we have to confront them head on. And when we have events like these, and it's great to see so many people here, we talk about building the Democratic Party and being more engaged and being engaged in the political process, really, I think, at one of the most challenging times in our nation's history. We have to be inclusive. We have to be welcoming to everybody, the people that wouldn't dare to walk into this chapel today. That's who we're fighting for. The people who've been left behind, the people that they don't feel that they belong, the people that wouldn't dare to open these doors and sit next to us for fear that they're different or not worthy. That's the challenge. How we do that is to believe in one, one each other, to understand what the challenges are and to actually have the courage to make change. And when you talk about what a safe and vibrant community is, for me, it leaves nobody behind. And it starts with access to affordable health care. Because if you don't have, absolutely. It may, be, it may be one thing to have health care. It's certainly another thing to have health care that you can't afford. And when we talk about one of the greatest issues in our state, the opiate epidemic, what it starts with for me is universal prenatal care for every woman in this state. And it, it means having a robust early education system for children so they can get a healthy start in this community and in this state. And it means having good public schools with robust and accessible mental health services for children and their entire families, understanding that trauma can be passed on from generations and that those that grow up in impoverished homes with domestic violence, with addiction, have lifelong impacts on people. And when we talk about the issue of public safety, we need prosecutors and people in leadership of power being willing to say that a mental health counselor is just as important as a police officer, is just as important as a prosecutor, a school counselor is just as important as anybody in this system of public safety. <laughs> But it doesn't, it doesn't stop at just good public schools. It's also about affordable higher education so people can actually achieve the American dream and go to college and get out of college not stuck with a boatload of debt. And it's about jobs. It's about good jobs for everybody. And understanding, you know, we have this debate in this state and in this country about who gets what, who gets paid what, and who shouldn't get paid. I've always believed in a rising tide lifts all boats. 
It's very simple. Give people the opportunity. Give them the tools and then get out of their way and let them create, let them innovate, let them develop based on their individual talent, based on their skill, based on their desire. We should be holding nobody back. And finally, when we talk about a safe and vibrant community, we should be talking about affordable housing. And we should be talking about diversity. And we should be talking about economic diversity. You know, <clears throat> I grew up right down the street from here. Great neighborhood, middle class. I probably couldn't, I could tell you, I couldn't afford to live in the neighborhood in which I grew up. And a community, a state, a country, is only as strong as the people who are in it. We have to find a place for everybody. We can't push people to the margins anymore and say that you don't belong. This is about opportunity because it truly is about that American dream. It doesn't matter if you've been here. It doesn't matter if you're coming here. Everybody gets a fair shot at it. That is what this country has always been about. It's been about respect. It's been about opportunity. And it's about believing in each other. And when we talk about respect and we talk about civility, we've lost that in our political discourse in this country, in my opinion. We've absolutely lost it. Where we've divided people based on their gender, we've, we've divided people based on their sexual orientation, we've di divided people based on their religion. This is un-American. This is un-American. You know, it really is, it's not my generation, it's your generation that is gonna prove the difference. Even looking out at this audience today, incredibly different than when I grew up. And you guys have to lead us. We need your help. And we need your help and we need your leadership in that respect, in being inclusive, in that civility, and even when we disagree with people, we respect their difference of opinion. It's okay to have a debate. It's not okay to demean. It's not okay to, to berate. Even when people who show up on this campus and take a knee during that national anthem, in my opinion, they are expressing their freedom of expression. And it's not a question, it's not a question of if you agree or disagree. It is a question, do you respect the constitution of this country? We have to elevate the discourse in this state. We have to elevate the discourse in our nation. Political debates and political differences is what the political process is all about. I don't have a problem with that. But what is happening today is entirely different. Where there is absolute fear and intimidation to be who you are. That's what's at stake right now. And do we believe, and the question for us is do we believe enough in each other to stand up and to speak out? To speak out against injustice. To speak out against hatred. To speak out against bigotry. That's the question that's confronting us. We need your help. And it comes in a lot of forms, whether it's based on the color of your skin, whether it's based on your gender, whether it's based on your religion, how you look, who you love. 
It's also based on your economic status. And we have marginalized so many people in this country, oftentimes in the name of public safety, through criminal convictions that have not made us more safe, but have just impoverished people, the generationally poor, increasingly people of color. And when you take that and you wrap that in to this issue, as I said, about heroin, yes, we have to have treatment. Yes, we need prevention. Yes, we need intervention. But we also need to have corporate accountability about who started this crisis in this country as well. So the challenge is for all of us. But my ask of you is to lead us, to lead people in leadership, to demonstrate that diversity works, to demonstrate that being inclusive matters, to demonstrate that you can disagree without being disagreeable, to respect differences, to respect difference of opinions, but always to respect the Constitution and the rights afforded to every single American, regardless of who you are or where you're from. So I wish I could end on a high note today, uh, but the challenges, they're daily. They are daily. But we cannot give up hope. We have to maintain. We have to be willing to stand together and to fight. And to fight not only through our political process, but through our courts. And most importantly, with you and your generation being engaged in the political process. You know, the best thing I've seen in terms of politics these last couple of months was this hashtag, run for something. I think it's the best advice ever. Run for something. Get involved. Make a difference. Show us that your generation is different. Show us that we should be following your leadership into the future to truly, to truly make this country an opportunity, a land of opportunity for everybody and truly to maintain its status as a beacon of hope for everybody around this world to come to this country and to seek a better life, not just for themselves, but for their children. That's the American dream. That's what we're fighting for. I thank you for your help. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Donnelly. I'm the president of the UVM Democrats and a sophomore here at UVM. I'm going to be brief because I'd like to bring up our congressman, the only congressman from the state of Vermont who has to leave in just a few minutes. Uh, Peter Welch has done some great things for Vermont, and so here's Congressman Welch. Hi, you guys. Good to, what a day. You know, uh, this is kind of exciting for me because one of the last times I was here, uh, standing here, uh, was in 2006 when I was running for my first term in Congress. And joining us at that time was not only Bernie Sanders, who was Bernie Sanders that we know and love, but is not, was not then the Bernie Sanders that everyone knows and everyone loves. Uh, but we also had another person here who was then an obscure uh, senator from Illinois by the name of Barack Obama. And, and uh, you know, it was exciting. I, I, I was in the state senate then, and I'm running for Congress. I'm pretty nervous about whether, you know, how I'm going to do. I uh, had a very good opponent. And uh, by the way, it was, this is only in Vermont. Uh, she was the adjutant general for the National Guard, the only 
female adjutant general in the entire country and widely respected in Vermont. And it was at the height of the Iraq war. And she was our face of the soldiers leaving, the soldiers coming home, and getting the bad news about the soldiers we lost. In Vermont, by the way, just so you know the kind of sense of service here, uh, we lost more soldiers per capita among our citizens in Iraq and Afghanistan than any other state. And in the Civil War, it was Vermont who made the biggest sacrifice among all the northern states. But uh, Martha Rainville was her name. She and I made an agreement. No negative ads. None. And we kept it. it they, they were the only contested race in the country where there was no negative ads. Now, I've been listening to a lot of the speakers here have been tremendous. And I just listened to TJ, and he talked about a lot of the issues. So I don't want to talk about that too much. And unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to go. I'm on the, the VPR, you know, Vermont edition. So it's like a hard time, and I've got to go. But let me tell you how I got involved in politics. When I was basically your age, it was the height of the civil rights movement. And I was at Holy Cross College, and it was between my sophomore and junior year. And some of my friends were going to be working in a community organization out in Chicago. I lived in Springfield, Mass. And I wanted to go, but I had to deal with my father that I'd make the money for my spending money at school, but he'd pay the tuition. But I wanted to go out there, but I had to finish making money. So on the 4th of July weekend, it was a four-day weekend, I got up from the dinner table. My brother gave me a ride down to the interstate, and I hitchhiked to Chicago. Right? And I got out there, and this community organization was on the west side. And the whole theory of it, if, I don't know if any of you have studied Saul Alinsky, was that you would engage with people in the neighborhood, ask them what was on their mind. And the thing that was on their mind at that point was the city of Chicago was not picking up the garbage in that neighborhood. So the community organizers got a couple of pickup trucks and brought the garbage down to City Hall. And you know what happened the next day? There was like a caravan of city sanitation trucks coming in the Lawndale taking that garbage out. And the whole point here was to try to I'll show people and work with people to see what power they had if they took effective action together. And as I stayed in, I was there, and I hitchhiked back uh, on that Monday. But later on, after I made the money I had to, I returned. And I was there for a total of two years, and I was a Robert Kennedy Fellow right after he was assassinated. But it was appalling to me what I came to learn in that West Side neighborhood where families were trying to get going, where it was all African-American families. Families, when they wanted to buy a house, could only buy it on contract. They couldn't get a mortgage. The Federal Housing Administration wouldn't insure a mortgage. Banks had redlined the area, and they wouldn't give people the mortgage. So anybody who wanted to buy a house, instead of buying it on a mortgage, they had to get it on, quote, a contract. And real estate speculators stuck it to them. They charged them twice the going rate for the, for the house. They charged almost twice the going rate on interest. And then the contract provision said that if you missed a payment after four or five years, you lost your house. You lost your house. Now, that is outrageous. But what I came to see in that neighborhood is these incredibly hardworking families. Some of them had two jobs, trying to make ends meet. But if somebody got sick and they missed a payment, they could be evicted and would be evicted from their home. That did not happen by accident. The laws of this country made it legal for those real estate speculators to rip off good, hardworking people. And it was all based then on an acceptance of discrimination. What got me then involved in politics is I saw, and I became a lawyer, I saw that these injustices that are around us, and if you're a sensitive person, you become aware of it. Not just how a person is treated by the color of their skin, 
but how the institutions and the laws reinforce a system that grinds people into the dust who are hardworking and decent people. So laws make a difference. Politics makes a difference. And the big decision that you make, you know, we talk about all of the issues. You know, prescription drug prices, access to health care. But the decision that you have to make, each of, each of us has to make, and it's not just when you're a young person getting about to get out of college. It's when you're an older person and you have to reinforce your commitment to the existential decision you made. Are you going to live a life where you promote inclusion and opportunity, or are you going to live a life where you're trying to seek privilege and protection? And I'm telling you, Washington right now is an absolute mess. Okay, But there's good people there engaged in this battle. What we've seen with that health care bill, which was not a health care bill, it was a tax cut bill, we were going to take health care away from 24 million people to give a tax cut of like $900,000 to the super rich. Those of us who oppose that were for inclusion. We were for opportunity. The ones who were against it we're for reinforcing privilege and protection. This tax bill that we're talking about now, all written in secret, by the way, among other things, it would mean that when you are starting to pay your student loans, under the current situation, you can lower, and your parents can deduct the interest they pay, you lose that. That's gone. By the way, the money's going to go to a really good place. Millionaires and billionaires, all right? So feel good that if you're paying more, they're paying even less. But the real issue here, you know, there's always going to be an issue that requires our attention, whether it's a fair tax system, expanding health care, standing up for people who are discriminated against. But the big decision that you have to make, that I have to make every single day, is whether to engage in that struggle together and fight for opportunity and fight for inclusion. It's its own reward, but there are forces that are constantly pulling you away. Sometimes they're legal. Sometimes you're having to make a tough choice about your own career. Sometimes you face the limitations of your own moral imagination. That's life. But the steady and the true course that you want to follow, I know, because you're here, is when the moment comes and you have to act, you're going to act on the side of inclusion and opportunity for every single person in your life. So I thank you for being here. That's the battle you face. But let me tell you something. It's fun to do it. <laughs> There's no guarantee of victory. I mean, I've, I'm in Congress now. I lost two races. I've been dumped by girlfriends. <laughs> and I still wonder why. <laughs> but you know, when you do something and you decide to do it together, you're going to feel better about yourself, and you're going to be able to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again when you have to face that new day. Thanks so much for letting me be here with you. Take care. How's everybody doing? Um, <laughs> my name's Carter Newbieser. I'm a sophomore at UVM um, and the president of UVM Progressives. Um, and like a lot of people who are student activists, I first got involved in, uh, in politics um, and activism because of Bernie's campaign. Um, he ran a historic campaign in 2016 when he kind of proved that we do not need corporate money um, and we don't need big lobbyists and big business in order to achieve the goals of equity, sustainability, and justice. Um, that's why I'm really proud, and I'm introducing someone, so I'll get to that real quick. But 
um, I'm really proud to announce that UVM progressives are going to be running student candidates for local government here in office. Um, we're taking... We're taking the political revolution that Bernie started in 2016 to campus, um, and if we just get 200 kids to vote, which is literally less than half this room, um, we win elections. Uh, so we need your involvement. We need you to come out. Um, the announcement event is on Thursday, the 16th, at 12 noon outside of the Bailey Howe Library. Um, so it's important that we get as many students there as possible. Um, so thank you for allowing me to plug that. Um, but. Uh, even though I do disagree with the mayor uh, on a number of issues like KBTL, um, Keep Burlington Local, right now we're fighting to uh, make sure that Burlington Telecom is sold to a co-op versus a private outside investor. Um, I still think, and I want to echo the comments already made, that um, you know, civility and respect in our political discourse is paramount, especially now with the man that we have the, in the White House, unfortunately. Um, and so... You know, we can't get too depressed about Donald Trump and his rhetoric um, and his style of politics. Um, and yeah, we just, as students, as progressives, we have to make sure that we are honoring that tradition of respectful and civil discourse. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to introduce Mayor Moreau um, of Burlington. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I guess it's uh, almost good afternoon. Thank you for sitting through, uh, through a lot. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and share just a few thoughts about the, the, the future of Burlington. I, I won't go on too long because Congressman Ellison has, uh, has arrived and it's exciting to have him here. And I know uh, hearing about his vision for the, the country is a big part of why you're here. Um, uh, you know, that said, uh, I didn't want to miss this opportunity just to speak to, to you about the importance of, of local elections. You know, we, we all know that young people uh, can have a huge impact on the direction of our country. You saw that with President Obama's two campaigns. You certainly saw that with Senator Sanders' run for president. But you can have a big impact on what happens here locally as well. And uh, as you consider um, whether you should vote in Vermont, vote in Burlington, um, come out on town meeting day in March, uh, I want you to know two things ab about, uh, maybe three things about your local government. One, um, we want you to work for the local government. We have a big city hall internship program that I started just after I got elected six years ago. Um, and I did it because my, I got my start in government as a intern almost, it's a crazy, I can't believe this, it's approaching 30 years ago now, I was an intern in Senator Leahy's office in Washington, D.C. And it was really a remarkable experience. I was there for eight months and I got to just see how a government office works and I just got to, I, you know, some people go to D.C. and they leave uh, totally jaded. I, I left inspired by how um, even when people didn't disagree, they were working to make their communities uh, better. And certainly Senator Leahy uh, has been at that for a long time. So we went, we, when I got to City Hall, we started that. And if you're interested in such an internship, we have about 30 interns over the course of the year. Go to the City Hall, BTV, BurlingtonVermont.gov website, and you can find information on how to apply. And we've had many UVM uh, students start as interns and then go on to jobs in, in local government, and uh, including in the mayor's office. I think uh, of the four of us in the mayor's office, um, we, we, we've had a couple uh, UVM um, graduates. Um, two other things I'd like you to know about your local government um, uh, right now is that one, uh, my administration, the city council is fighting for opportunity as a city and we are fighting for opportunity for you. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. And we are also fighting very hard for the environment. Let me expand on both of those just a little bit. When I um, took office, again, it was, it, was almost, it was five and a half years ago, we had just come through a 12-year period where we had built only 18 new homes open to the general public in a 12-year period. 18 new homes in the whole downtown. Um, this is a dozen years that included a huge housing boom that changed downtowns, authentic, great downtowns like Burlington throughout the rest of the company, but it didn't happen in Burlington. Why, why is that? Is it because people don't want to live in downtown Burlington? I, I don't believe that, and I think there's a lot of indication that's not the case. It happened um, because we had sort of lost our way with our local parking policies, been way too focused on the automobile. We lost our way with 
local zoning and land use policies that made it almost impossible to build anything new in the downtown. And as you know, we, um, I don't think ever thought of it this way, but the effect of that is we had, what we had been building is we'd been building walls around Burlington. We had been making it harder and harder for people to come uh, if they wanted to start a career or an opportunity in Burlington, and we made it harder for people to stay. And you could see that in the stats back in, in the 2012. We did a study and we found that over, over that 12 year period when we were building almost no new homes, the number of young people living in the downtown had shifted dramatically. Uh, there had been uh, about 30% about of the li people living in the downtown had been young households at the beginning of that 12 year period. It was down to under 20% at the end of that period. There, the average Burlingtonian had gone from back in the 80s pay paying about 30% of their income for rent to in 2012 paying 44% of their income in rent, one of the highest ratios anywhere in the company, in the country. And we had also seen, and I bet some of you in this room have seen this, we'd seen the steady decline of Burlington housing stock as landlords realized they could charge these very high rents without keeping up their homes, investing in them, uh, because there's no new competition being built. And they could charge more and more without making appropriate investments. This, is, this kind of mistake had been made across the country. And one of the last things President Obama did is he issued a report saying that these local land use decisions together have been building up and they have become a major driver in income inequality across the country. And they've also become a major driver in dragging down our economy. And they, President Obama said, you got to start breaking these barriers down, these rules down, these walls down. And that's, that's what we've been trying to do over the last five and a half years. And it's starting to work. And you see it start to work within a few days. I know many of you came out last November and voted for this. That redevelopment of the 1970s suburban mall in the downtown, it's going to start coming down in the next few days. And what's going to replace it is a, a great mixed-use neighborhood with people of all economic backgrounds living in it that has jobs and hundreds of homes. You know, we went 12-year periods only building 18 homes. We're going to build 274 homes uh, in that one project over the next couple of years. Something similar has happened down on North Avenue where the Cambrian Rise project is starting to emerge as this mixed-use community that includes a new 12-acre park and it also includes 600, 700 new homes for people of all backgrounds uh, over the next decade. Um, we, I and others on the city council are working towards a vision of Burlington that remains a place that is open to people of all backgrounds, that remains a place that welcomes new Americans from refugee crises around the world, that remains a place that is Burlington, is Vermont city where people can come to if they want to start a job, they want to start a career, they want to start a business, they want to start a family. Burlington should be that place. That vision of Burlington is at risk and this uh, administration has tried to make sure that, that that vision continues. We are also fighting for the environment. What, what I mean by this is, is this, you know, one of the great things about being mayor and being part of a city government is we actually get to, to do things, not just talk about things, not just debate laws, we actually get to, to build things and, and operate the departments and we can do that in a way that moves the environment forward and we are doing that. Burlington in 2014, I was lucky to be the mayor when Burlington became the first city in the country to source 100% of our electricity from renewable generation. A remarkable achievement. We went from about 25% to 100% in a little over a decade. We're doubling down on that strategy, and we are now going to become a net zero energy city across electricity, transportation, ground transportation, and thermal sectors over the next 10 to 15 years. We're going to do that by, thank you. The way we get it, we're going to do that is exciting, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, um, uh, and it's innovative. We are going to become, we're going to create a, downtown and a hill that is powered by district energy where we use the waste heat from our McNeil biomass plant to heat the downtown and the hill. And we are gonna do it through strategic electric electrification where we move our automobile fleet from being gasoline powered to being electric powered. This is happening every month right now in part because of new initiatives, new uh, incentives being created by the Burlington Electric Department. And it's going to be happened by empowering individuals and households to own 
and direct their energy future through better tools and better awareness of uh, energy consumption. That vision of Burlington as a city of opportunity, as a city of sustainability, will be on the March ballot just a few months from now, town meeting day, the first week in March 2018. And it will be on the ballot in, in city council races, including city council races that many of you can choose to vote in if you like. You have a city councilor in Adam Roof who is a great champion of that opportunity and sustainability, and I hope you will come out and support him. And it will certainly be debated and very much uh, in front of voters in the mayoral race. And uh, I, I ask for your support uh, as you think about who to come out and support next March. And if you are interested in getting involved in the campaign or seeing more about what the Weinberger administration is about, you can do that at www.moreauformayor.com. Thank you. It's been a great honor to be here with you this morning. My fellow UVM students, UVM faculty, Vermont state officials, and members of the community. My name is Asfar Basha, and I'm the vice president of the College Democrats here at the University of Vermont. Today, I have the unique privilege of introducing a man whom I've looked up to for much of my life. On November 7, 2006, Keith Ellison was elected to the United States House of Representatives to represent Minnesota's fifth congressional district. He is the first African American to be elected to the United States House from Minnesota and the first Muslim to be elected to the United States Congress in the history of our country. As a Muslim American and person of color myself, I had a remarkably tough task of finding leaders to emulate and look up to and quite frankly see myself in especially during the post 9-11 era. I grew up during a time where a spotlight was being shined on a small group of people who radically misinterpreted my religion for barbarism and carried out heedless acts of violence. I grew up during a time where the term terrorism became a synonym for Islam. And this crushed me, not only as an American who aspires to be a leader, but an American who was convinced that anything is possible in this country. But with the election of Congressman Ellison and the election of our party's chair, Fassel Gill, I had leaders who looked like me, although Congressman Ellison's probably a little bit better looking, and, <laughs> and they shared the same faith as me, and most importantly, they held the same values that I hold. Congressman Ellison and party chair, Fassel Gill, uh, you guys have been my beams of hope. You know, hope that change is possible and that change is imminent. Congressman Ellison has always been a fighter for the people. As vice chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Congressman Ellison, along with 70 other members of Congress, advocate and work to enforce stricter campaign finance laws, to provide high quality health care that is universally available and affordable, to ensure that minority Americans have an equal and fair shot at success, to make sure that working Americans are treated justly and are compensated fairly and have the ability to unionize, to protect the rights of all Americans, and to emphasize diplomacy as the resolution to our global conflicts as to preserve global security and peace. Congressman Ellison's reputation for making college affordable, protecting our civil rights, and standing up to corporate juggernauts undeniably demonstrates that he is a representative for and of the people. I believe he embodies what it means to be a true progressive Democrat. Congressman Ellison, you have not only been a role model to me, but a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota's 5th Congressional District. How are you guys doing? So, let me tell you, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to talk for about maybe three minutes, maybe four. I need you guys to let me know when four minutes come. And then I'm going to ask you if you want to ask me anything. And this is going to be like an AMA on Reddit. <laughs> is everybody all right with that? Is that a good way to go? 
So I just want to tell you that a little story. Uh, right after the Civil War, it was over, the Civil War was over, and um, people had come home from the battle. And uh, there were some folks in the North, and they were going to have an uh, election. And uh, there was basically two contestants in the election. And the first one walked up and said, in the Civil War, I was a general. I was a leader of men. I led men into battle. I know how to command. I know how to give orders. Vote for me. And the next person walked up and says, I was a private. And I uh, endured the heat and the cold. I slept outside or sometimes under tent. I saw my friend shot and die. And before I was a soldier, I was a farmer. And if any of y'all out there in this big crowd of 5,000 people were generals, you vote for him. All of y'all who were privates and sergeants in the real army, which everybody was, <laughs> vote for me. He got a rousing applause when he said that. And when he went to Congress, they called him private, you know, uh, John Smith. What's my point? Today's Veterans Day. And I want you all to think a little bit about the people in your life who have laid it all on the line for our country. Now, I don't want to get into debate with you about whether Iraq was right or wrong. or That's not what this is about. This is about devotion, this is about commitment, this is about sacrifice. My son is a uh, specialist in the United States Army, and he is a combat medic. He's assigned to a cavalry scout unit. Right now he's in Fort Sam Houston getting extra training, and he went to the Army right out of high school. He has only spent a few days in college. And I tried to tell him, son, if you really want to do that, why don't you go get an ROTC? Why don't you do it another way? He's like, no, this is what I'm going to do. And he went and did it. Even though I wasn't all the way on board because I had another, another idea of what his future needed to be. But the problem is, when you raise your kids to be independent thinkers, they tend to be independent thinkers, even, <laughs> even when it comes to you. <laughs> and uh, he did his thing, and now I couldn't be more proud of him he helps save people's lives who get hurt in the battlefield. He runs into harm's way to help rescue people. And for his sake and so many others, I just want to say to any of you who might be vets out there, uh, happy Veterans Day. I also want to say to I also want to, to just remind all of us that there's a whole big difference between people, men, rich men usually, who order young men and women nowadays into battle and the people who are actually called to fight those battles. There's a mountain of difference between the two. They didn't ask my son Elijah whether there should be soldiers in Africa or Ukraine. They didn't ask his opinion about whether he should go. You know, they just sent, right? So he just follows the orders, which is what soldiers do. So put your arms around the vets even if you think the war was wrong, even if you think it was the wrong policy and the wrong thing, don't, don't, don't blame the bets for that. Will y'all, will y'all do that? Will y'all do that? Okay, thank you. Because vets often are the, they are the teachers, they are the uh, firefighters, they are the people who fix our roads, they're the people who work in the public works. They're the, they're the working people of this country. They're the people who uh, either make this country work or not work. And the interesting thing about working people, if the workers at the McDonald's that you might go to, might go to, don't show up, there ain't going to be no hamburger served that day. If the CEO doesn't show up, so what? <laughs> He's probably playing golf anyway. The bottom. I want you all to understand, and you probably do understand, but I just want to just reemphasize that, um, that our country is in a particular unique historic moment. Wealth and income inequality in America today has never been worse since the Gilded Age. 
your parents and grandparents and even great grandparents don't remember it being this bad because it hasn't been this bad since about the eight, since about 1910, 1890s. But in those days, because there was such a dramatic gap between the rich and everybody else, folks like F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote books um, about this, uh, and you should read those books. You should get familiar uh, uh, with books like The Great Gatsby and other books of that age, because what they will do is give you a window into a time when our country had tremendous gaps between the rich and everybody else, much like they do now. And we do need those windows because we don't see the very rich. Because if you go to the airport, they don't fly commercial. They fly in their own planes. Seriously. And we do need those guests because unless you are a member of a very elite country club, you don't see them recreate. Even if you do play golf, they don't play golf with you. These folks make decisions about whether the plant's going to stay here in Vermont or whether it's going to close and open up in Mexico. They make decisions about your life. They decide whether or not we're going to take on climate change seriously or not. They make big decisions about what happens to you. And they're not content just to take their money and make a whole bunch of money. They want to take that money and then buy political influence. And you better believe they beat a path. They wear a hole in my carpet coming to try to get people like me to do what they want. Right now, they want a big old tax cut. I call it a tax cut scam. You know, let me just tell you a little bit about it. Let me just tell you a little bit about this tax cut. This tax cut says we're going to get rid of the estate tax. You have to, as an individual, you have to have an estate worth $5.3 million to even pay it. You ought to be glad to be able to pay the estate tax because that means you're rich, very rich. And here's the thing about it, you want to get rid of the estate tax, if you don't have an estate tax, you know what you're going to have in America? A hereditary aristocracy. And you kind of already have one. You're going to make it worse. And by the way, they want to cut the corporate tax rate. They want to lower it to, from about 39 to all the way down to about 20%. And do corporations not have any money nowadays? I think they're doing quite well. There's over $3 trillion offshore. And if they had to pay taxes on that money, they'd have to pay about $900 billion, which would mean they could, bring, they could help pay for public education, public health, you name it. But they're like, look, between me getting even richer than I already am and giving money so that some little kids can go to Head Start, give me the money. That's their attitude. We cannot allow this kind of thing to take place. Not as, a, not as people who live in a democratic society. We have to step up and say that the public interest is served if everybody pays their fair share. We have to say that the public interest is served if people who benefit from being in this country contribute to the expenses of this country. I don't think that's too much to ask. I think it's fair. I think it's fair to say, you know, look, uh, if you want to get rid of deductions like state and local deductions, which is when you have state and local places that raise taxes from their population to pay for expenses of their society, now we're going to punish them for that by getting rid of that deduction? They want to take deduction away from school, from, from medical expenses, co college interest loan, they want to make that not deductible anymore? And yet, at the very same time, they want to say that if you offshore a company, if you, take your, if you close down your company in Vermont and open it up in another country, the taxes that you would have to pay are going to actually be as low as 10 or maybe even 5% or none. Whereas if you have that same corporation in the United States, you're going to have to pay at least 20 under their tax plan. Many of you may think taxes, man, I don't pay them. I just go down to H&R Block. I, don't, I just get a TurboTax thing. It's, it's all complicated. Who feels that way? Anybody? I'm telling you that I am asking you to lock into this tax debate going on in Congress right now. They are getting ready to pick your pocket. They are getting ready to take money from working people and middle class people and shift it upward. And after they do it, there's going to be a whole lot less money to make sure that the water's clean, that the air's clean, that we're investing in public schools and public education. If they get away with this, we are going to be a poorer society for it. 
And by the way, they will tell you stuff like this. Oh, well, the reason we're doing this is because if the rich people get more money, they're going to invest in plant and equipment, and, and, and it's going to trickle down to you. Well, I prefer what John F. Kennedy said. He said a rising tide lifts all boats. And they think that tax cuts to the rich trickles down to the rest of y'all. It's the difference between bottom up, top down. Which one do you prefer? You don't know? <laughs> so my point is, as college students, you have a lot more riding than any of us folks who are in the 40 and above crowd. Because we'll all be dead by the time this climate crisis is really, really awful, and even people in Vermont and Minnesota can't even escape it if we don't do something now. We don't want you to live in this, in this kind of society. And in fact, in the Gilded Age, there was a movement that cropped up called the Progressive Era. Who ever heard of it? We need some progressives around here right now. And these people took on big, big uh, concentrated markets where there was two and three and four companies that dominated the whole market. They took on the steel barons. They took on the railroad barons. They took on all these folks. And then they got a president who was willing to help bust up these trusts. We need, a, we need to bust up some of these trusts right now. Let me just tell you this, and I'm going to wrap up, and we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. Right now, with all the money that has been accumulating at the top of our economy, yes, they do stock buybacks. Yes, they buy political influence. You know what else they do? Mergers. There's something called Merger Monday. You know what that is? Where these big companies just buy each other off. I mean, just this week, Merger, I mean, about a few weeks ago, you had Amazon talking about buying Whole Foods. But then you have mergers being announced almost every day. That's what happens when you got these massive monopoly profits that are just accumulating. They don't go into plant and equipment to extend jobs. They go into mergers. They go into buying political influence. They go into buying stock options so they can boost up their share price. And you may think, oh, that's some economic stuff. Let me tell you, this stuff matters for you. Because if you're a worker and you got 80 different companies in the same industry and you say, look, you're not paying me right. I'm going to go to the other guy. Then the other company will say, okay, yeah, we'll pay you a little bit better because we want to compete for labor. But if there's only two or three makers, how, you don't have any options. They, they, these people golf together. They're going to decide what your pay is going to be, and that's what it's going to be. Or if you're an innovator, you come up with a brand new way to do what they're doing, only better and cheaper. Why don't they just buy you out and keep doing it the way that makes them all that money? Cuts down on innovation. Our country has had a drop in the number of startup businesses. Did you know that? Who knew that? Why? It's not because of job-killing regulations. It's because of monopoly. That's why it is. So if you love this country and the people in it, we need you to step up big time. Create a brand new progressive movement for this day and in this time. And fight for all kinds of things like, first, democracy. Fight for democracy. Make sure that we eliminate this thing where you have 90 million people who don't vote in the last presidential election. Reach out to every Vermonter to make sure that they know that they can participate in this democracy and they have a choice to make. Make sure you go to the farms. Make sure you go to the city. Make sure you go to the suburbs. Make sure you go to the men and women. Make sure you go to the LGBTQ community. Make sure you go to people of all colors. Make sure you go to the people who were born here and the people who came here. Make sure you go to everybody and engage them and tell them that if we are involved, things will get better. Then what you do is you tell them, is you go out there and you tell them that if we fight for things that are going to help our lives, like free college tuition, not too much to ask for. People say, oh, we can't afford that. OK, fine. How come Germany, Norway, and Sweden can afford it? And by the way, in all of them countries, you can go to the doctor, too, and don't have to worry about bankruptcy if you do. And by the way, they're investing in child care. They're investing in all these things. And guess what? They have more startups per capita than we do. So you think, oh, that's socialism. That'll kill uh, the, you know, the market economy. Oh, how come that's not happening in Sweden? They got more startups than we do per capita. What I'm telling you is, 
A better America is right in front of you, but you've got to grab it. And it's not falling in your lap because the people who have it going their way like it like that. But if you're willing to stand up and to organize and to fight for what you believe in and to run the risk that somebody's not going to like what you're saying when you argue for democracy, then you can get a better America. We used to have an America where 33% of all workers were in unions. Now we're down to single digits because these big companies bust unions and attack unions and fire people who try to organize them. Most workers will say that I would like a union if I could get one. But you want a union, but you need a job. And so if they threaten somebody or fire them, they might just say, well, I'd like to have a union, but I can't run the risk. So let me just say this as I close, and then we're going to do some Q&A. America has always had social problems that it had to confront. That's not new. But America has always seen young people at the forefront of solving those social problems. It might be climate change and mass incarceration and police violence today. But it was civil rights yesterday. And it was all kinds of stuff that young people have always been at the cutting edge of. Your country needs you to step up and demand a greater, more democratic society, a more inclusive society, a fairer economy. You can deliver these things, but it won't be easy. But I have so much faith in you. So let me just say to you guys, have a happy Veterans Day. Thank a veteran. Thank, you, thank the people you know in your family. And you thank them for, for demonstrating commitment and sacrifice and love for this nation. And then you go out there and demonstrate that same sacrifice, whether you're in the military or not, by fighting for this society that we live in. So let's do some Q&A. All right. I may have exceeded my four minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, but I'll call on whoever's hand I see first. Right there, you got to use your outside voice. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, you have to stand up and you're going to have to really come from the diaphragm. Okay, so it's still very hard to hear, but I think you asked me what do I think the intent of the GOP plan, tax plan is to not allow deduction of interest on student loans. Is that right? Right. Okay, what do I think the intent is? Well, there's a few levels of intent. Did, did everybody hear what she said? So on a tuition waiver, you can, that, there's deductibility there. So if they get rid of that, then you're going to have to pay up more and it's going to reduce your award, right? Their intent is multi-layered. The first one is they want to give a lot of money to rich people. And in order to do it, they're happy to take it from students. That's one, number one. Because if, you know, obviously if you have less revenue coming in, then that's going to create a debt or deficit. And they say they don't like debt and deficit, so they got to try to find some pay for it. So they're taking it, out of you, they're taking it out of your pocket with the holy jeans on it because you're a barista as you're going through college, right? And they're putting it into, you know, the uh, Monopoly man's pocket. You know, the, on the game Monopoly, you know, the guy with the mustache, you know, they're putting it into his pocket. That's one thing. The other thing is that I, I'm, you asked me what I believe the intent is. What I really believe is that a lot of Republicans believe that uh, college students are, are, are too liberal and that in order to make them more conservative, you've got to pinch them. And, and if they feel desperate, then they might feel, then they might look out, be more inclined to look out after only themselves, which is a good setup to make somebody more conservative. Because the basic conservative idea is to conserve privileges for the people who already have it. And so I think that it's an idea to, you know, that's, that, you know, I think it's about that. I think, you know, they're always talking about how college campuses are too liberal. And so, you know, you get students who are desperate and, and, and got a lot of money that they got to come up with to get an education. And I think they think that's going to shift the political sensibilities of college students. So I think there's not just this numeric, not just a monetary goal but also a, a political one. 
So uh, fight it. If you can, uh, make, you know what? Draft up what you said to me on a card and hand them out so students know what's going on. The biggest problem, and I'll say this to all of y'all, is that when we were fighting to stop the repeal of health care, people get health care. You know what I mean? They get it. Like, I got, I'm sick, I go to the doctor, they're going to make it harder for me to do that. I get that. The tax thing is a little bit harder for people to grasp, but that just means we got to work a little harder to make them, help them grasp it. And if you will, uh, you ask me that question, which is a very important thing for you to do, you just made a contribution to fighting this tax bill just by asking me that. You want to do a little more? Draft it up on a postcard and hand them out so the students know what's happening to them. They think this is something happening to their parents. They're like, I don't make no money. I'm a, you know, I work at Starbucks. No, no, they're trying to come after your dough too. So thank you for asking that. That was a great question. I want to give her a hand. I want to, um, uh, oh, we got a microphone now uh, right there in the back and the, the guy in the black hoodie. That's him, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my question is similar. Um, okay. It's, it's also, can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you sound good. <laughs> it's also about the um, proposed health care plan. Um, the what health care plan? The proposed health care plan okay. by the Republicans. Yeah. My question is like, I did a lot of research on it for class, and Great. what exactly is the intention period of the health care plan? Because it doesn't seem to give health care to be, the intention doesn't seem to be to give health care to as many people as possible. So I don't want to believe that these people are dumb or, or evil. They're not. You are right to eliminate that as a possibility. They're not dumb. Well, then, if they're not dumb, then what's the alternative? Then, then what do you got left? Well, I don't want to think that they're evil. I just... I... <laughs> well, put it like this. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, object, evil is a, an objective thing. And sometimes it's a matter of perspective. From their perspective, it's like, look, I don't believe the government should help people except people like me. And why are we spending money to help all these people who can't afford health care to get health care? You can have health care if you can afford it. And if you can't afford it, that just means you're not a very worthy person. And I know you don't want to buy that, but I urge all of you guys to look up the term social Darwinism. Look up social Darwinism. There are people, now Charles Darwin never said the survival of the fittest. Did you know that? You guys are college students, you know about Darwin. He never said survival of the fittest. It was a social Darwinist who invented this term. And if you just think about the idea that which, which species survive, well, those are the, the, the hardiest, strongest ones survive. The truth is, that's not true. The species that survives are the ones that make the most babies. Which, you know, you know evolution belongs to the lovers, not the fighters. It's true, <laughs> believe me. And, 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 so, and so, the social Darwinist says it is the cleverest, greediest, most uh, aggressive, most avaricious who will survive, and those who aren't that, they don't have. And, why, and why, give, why give things to people who history has not favored, who evolution has not favored? They're weak, they're dumb, garbage in, garbage, in, garbage out. Why put good money after bad? You understand what I'm saying? They believe that. And the fact that that philosophy really helps line their pockets is, you know, a side benefit, they say. But I mean, if you've ever studied Fountainhead, anybody ever read Atlas Shrug or Fountainhead? Anybody? Uh, Ayn Rand? She, this is basically just what she says. Society should favor the strongest, the smartest, the individual, and everybody else can just, you know, do the best they can with what they got. And so the basis, I mean, let me tell you, Paul Ryan, who is the Speaker of the House, requires everybody who works in his congressional office to read Ayn Rand. Did you know that? And if you don't know who Ayn Rand is, you need to learn about who Ayn Rand is. But she is a Russian immigrant to the United States who came up with a philosophy that um, 
the, that, that the individual knows, owes nothing to society and that the highest moral good is pleasing oneself. That's what she believes. Now, if that kind of code of philosophy is animating that person's action, in their mind, helping poor, giving money to poor people is wasting money because they're not, they're, they're just gonna waste it. Give it, to the, give it to the people who already made some money because those are the ones who have been smart enough to, and clever enough and lucky enough to get some money. Does that, I mean, yeah, I'm not asking you to agree, but do you understand what I'm saying? You got, the main point is, why do they want to strip health care from people who need it? Because they think, because they don't think people are worth it. And when you talk, when you hear people say, cut food stamps, cut uh, Meals on Wheels, cut um, uh, uh, Head Start, it's all, that, that's all a version of social Darwinism. And I really hope y'all look up, what is social Dar Darwinism? What is it? Who is Ayn Rand? You know, look these things up. There's not going to be too many more times in your life when you can just seek out knowledge. This is one of them. Do not waste it. Go after it. And I don't care what you're studying, you should know something about social Darwinism because it is informing the decisions of a lot of people who are making decisions for you. Nick, over here. Restricting of electric lines is a state level. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done in Congress? Thank you. Is there anything that can be done in Congress for them to address this issue? Because it's been around for a long time, and you've got three years before these lines are going to be drawn again. Right. So the question has to do with gerrymandering. Does any who does not know what gerrymandering is? Please raise your hand if you don't know what it is. Don't be shy. I mean, we're in a college campus. If you don't know what it is, I am more than happy to explain it to you. I just don't want to waste your time. So I'm assuming that everyone knows what it is. Am I right? OK, who knows what it is? Put your hand up. OK, good. So there's racial gerrymandering. There is partisan gerrymandering. Is there anything Congress can do? This Congress is a product of gerrymandering. They're not going to change gerrymandering. But one thing I will tell you this, and I'm, I come here and I'm saying this as a Democrat. This is kind of sacrilegious for me to say as a Democrat, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't believe in any kind of partisan gerrymandering. I think that we should fight for the seats and convince the people to vote for us. I'm not asking for any advantages. I just want a fair chance to talk to the people, and I believe we will win most of the time. So that's what I believe about gerrymandering. I think we need to have some national legislation that, you know, says that if you're gonna, if you're gonna gerrymander, um, we're going to, uh, we'll give you incentives around having a fair system, setting up a nonpartisan gerrymandering board like they have in Arizona. You know, we need to create a, an incentive system to make sure that states who have prerogative over uh, election stuff will not gerrymander. I also am a very strong proponent of a constitutional amendment for the right to vote. Now, you all might be surprised to know that there is no explicit right to vote in the Constitution. Now, some people will argue there's an implicit right to vote in the Constitution, but there is no, we all agree there is no explicit right to vote. Now, are there any law students in the House today? Okay, well, let me tell you, okay, there you go. So let me, so you know that when Congress or a state body by, passes a law that uh, impinges upon a fundamental right, then the court's supposed to apply strict scrutiny, right? You know about this stuff. And when they pass a law on economic stuff, then it's just, is it rational, right? That, have you had con law yet? Okay, so, all right. So, foreshadowing of things to come. <laughs> um, strict scrutiny means that, the, that if you're gonna pass a law that's gonna impinge upon a fundamental right, you have to have narrowly tailored means for, um, for compelling state interests, right? And what that would mean is that if you pass a law that undermines the right to vote, if there is an explicit right to a vote, then it would be analyzed by courts under strict scrutiny. Now, this sounds kind of legalistic, but my point is, nowadays, if the state says we're gonna require a photo ID and there, because we believe there's imposter voting, and by the way, folks, there is no imposter voting, okay? 
um, then it's just, a, it's just looked at under like, is it rational? I think it's irrational. Because some courts will say it's rational to prevent fraud, there, although there's no fraud. But if it was a constitutional thing where there was an explicit right to vote, then is it narrowly tailored? No, it isn't, because it hits a lot of people who, are, who can provably vote and have been voting for years. Is, it, is there a compelling state interest? Well, there might be to make sure to prevent fraud, but this is not doing that. Because there's literally, out of, out of the billions of votes that are cast over the last 10 years, there's like the, the numbers of imposter voting are literally under 100. There's, liter there's functionally no voter fraud, but there's a lot of people excluded because they don't have an ID, right? Like over 200,000 people in the state of Wisconsin alone. So I think one thing we can do in answer to your question is pass a constitutional amendment. All this requires that we've got to have an alive movement, which will put a power majority in Congress and which will support a constitutional amendment, uh, which is well within our grasp to do, but not immediately. Let's keep going. Uh, where's my friend with the microphone? Um, I want to talk about um, since the 2016 election within like the left side, there's been a lot of divide. Um, right. I think that obviously with you, it's uh, a little personal. How do you, like, what is your advice or do you have any insight on how the Democratic Party can unite and go forward so that way we can kind of put a lot of the stuff that's happened in the past behind us and, and understand a way to move forward so that way we can. Great question. Great question. Forward. Great question. Let me answer the question this way. First of all, organize on the local level as much as you can. Get out there and engage the grassroots and invite people in. Second of all, do not let cynicism come in. Just because somebody did something that they shouldn't have done, don't let that impact, impact you because in the city council race in Burlington, maybe that thing that happened doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Here's the third thing, and it's the third thing. Demand that there's true accountability and acknowledgement of the unfairness. In my opinion, no, the DNC should not have signed a document between one party to uh, who was running for the nomination and the party saying that that person, in exchange for money, gets to appoint the communication staff and other staff. Everybody following me? Everybody read about Donna Brazil book? In my opinion, it wasn't fair. And it, was, it wasn't fair to Bernie. It wasn't fair to millions of Americans. There needs to be an acknowledgement of that. I'm saying that. I don't care who doesn't like it. But I also want to tell you that unfairness does not give you an excuse to check out or to quit. What it means is that the party should and I will personally fight for acknowledgement and reform. And not only do we want to make sure there's no inside tracks in the future, we want to make sure that we complete, we revolutionize the superdelegate uh, situation. There shouldn't be 715 people who, who basically get to, we shouldn't be spotting any candidate uh, a, a number of votes from the front end. We need to open up these primaries. We need to make, so like in New York, if you don't register to, to, for the Democratic primary like six months in advance, you can't even vote. What if your birthday is in September and the primary is also in, later in September? Then you're 18, but you can't vote in the Democratic primary because you haven't registered six months ago, which would have been impossible for you to do. This, is not, this needs to be reformed. We need to figure out how to open it up, include it, the caucus system. Now, some states like mine in Minnesota, we have a caucus system. But I believe we ought to contemplate either a primary that goes along with it or a system where you can come in, vote, and go. And it needs to be all day. So that, you know, if you work in the second shift, how are you going to go to caucus? You can't go. So we need to be able to reform that. But if we will embrace reform, we will, in, we will, we will earn the trust of the people, and if we have the trust of the people, we will win, not just one election, but into the future. Uh, does that answer your question? Thank you. Is it, it's working. 
Um, I'm wondering what y'all in Congress are doing to reform uh, financial aid. Oh, yeah. For colleges, because I know that, at least in my situation, um, my family cannot pay for college out of pocket. However, right. we also were not eligible for financial aid. I, I know what you mean, man. You're right in that middle group, you know, working class family. You know, you guys can meet your bills, but paying some big tuition nut is just too much. And yet, you're, you're, you're too rich to get the financial aid, but you're, too, but you're not rich enough to just pay for everything. And man, millions of families are in that situation. And I just want to say to you guys, I'm 54 years old. When I graduated from law school at the age of 25, my total debt was $12,000. And that's because I borrowed money because I got married at the age of 23 and had two kids by the time I graduated from law school. I don't recommend that. <laughs> What's my point? I graduated from law school in 1990. I didn't owe much debt at all. I was able to walk into a pretty good job. I was able to buy a house within three years of getting out of law school. Um, when, when, when my wife got pregnant, I was able to pay all the family's bills while she was taking care of that part of our family. And to me, that just seems impossible for young people today. And yet, you're better educated than my generation. You've done, mo you got more education, you're more tech savvy, you're smarter, you're more creative, you're less racist. <laughs> I'm serious, you are. I mean, you're like better than us, right? If you look at it, and yet you are more debt burden. Your wages are lower if you adjust for inflation. When I tell you that you guys got as much on the line as anybody in this society, I am not lying to you. What do we do about it? Well, Bernie Sanders did all the country a great favor by saying, what about free tuition? I, seriously, some of y'all have been told, oh, this cannot happen. Well, wait a minute. If you got a hedge fund man manager making 28 million a year, why couldn't they get by with 20 million a year? If you got a McDonald's CEO making $9,000 an hour, couldn't they make it on $4,000 an hour? You understand what I'm saying? This is the richest country in the history of the world. This country allowed for these people to become this rich. Why shouldn't folks pay their fair share so that other people can have a chance? Let me be honest with you. I don't have a problem with people being rich. I wish I was rich. I really don't have a problem with it. But I'll tell you what I have a problem with. You getting up that ladder or being born at the top of the ladder, and then you want to pull up the ladder. That's wrong. People should not have to worry about going to the doctor or getting their education or getting around. We should have a strong transportation system. We should have a strong educational system. And we should have a strong health care system. And then what you want to do after that, that's up to you. you, you know. I mean, there's more that society should do, but I mean, there should be some basic things. So if you want to go, listen, you're a college kid, you might be coming up with some cool new way to like make energy, right? Renewable energy, you came up with this great thing, it's gonna revolutionize everything. Well, how are you gonna go pursue that dream if you don't have any health care and you owe 80 grand? It's killing innovation in our society. The United States, if there was one word that would describe us at our best, at our best now, one word, what would that word be? Audience participation. I said at our best. <laughs> at our best. At our best. Somebody said innovative. I would say possibility. I am telling you that if you go to a white farmer in Vermont or a black hospital janitor in Chicago, and you ask them, both of them will say, my son's going to be a doctor. My daughter's going to be an engineer. My baby's going to be something. They both will say that. You may think, oh, they're very different. You know, only in superficial ways. In the most important ways, they care about their family and their kids, and they would do anything for them. Both of them would feel that way. Don't you doubt that. I've talked to lots of folks. I'm telling you, making sure that college tuition is affordable, that kids can graduate without any student debt, and, or even free college, 
is within our ability to do. It's a matter of political will. And it's a matter of political imagination. One of the saddest things is when you see college kids lower their imagination about what might be possible in our society. Oh, I've been told that can't happen. You've been listening to the wrong people. You got to believe that this society has better days ahead. That this society is a society of possibility. That the wealth that this country has generated should be used to help people who are trying to climb that ladder. And just because somebody's at the top of that ladder doesn't mean they get to just get more and get more at the expense of other people. I want you to believe that if you've done really well in this economy, bless you. Now, help the folks who haven't hit the bell like you have. Some of you might be from very wealthy families. I don't want, we don't need your guilt. It doesn't help us. But what we need you to do is to say, you know what, we've done well, and I'm glad I'm doing well. Other people should be able to do well. That's all we need from you. Because if you're making $400,000 a year, which is not, actually it's not, it's a lot of money, but it's not tons. There's people way richer than you. I mean, but why wouldn't you want to kick in a little more so some poor kid could go to kindergarten? I mean, really, you're not going to be in the free cheese line. You're not going on food stamps. You're fine. But we live in a society where it's like, I don't want to do nothing for nobody except myself and my family. And they do drop the ladder sometimes for people who they know, the people they want to hook up. I'm saying that a generous society doesn't give everything to everyone because that's just waste. But a generous society makes sure that everybody has basic needs met and can climb that ladder. Part of it is helping people like you who is smart, who wants to study, who has a goal, who believes that better days are ahead, but just needs their society to just get your back a little bit. And I don't think it's too much to ask. So I just want you guys to know that I'm getting the high sign over here that I got to wrap it up. So let's take one more, and then I probably got to hit, hit the door. Yep, in the pink hoodie. Yep, you got to talk loud. Oh. Two more. We'll do this one and that one, and them guys can wait for a second. Yeah. Yeah, go. No, let's get the mic person, and then we'll bring the mic to you, then we'll be done. Okay. Hi. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I um, am an, a youth organizer. I'm Great. a senior, and I plan on devoting my career to grassroots organizing. I love that. Um, my biggest issue is dealing with, even after the election, while there was a big influx of people wanting to work in this field, um, there's still just a considerable amount of apathy. Yeah. Um, a lot of people feel it's a big issue. There's so much. Where do you start? Um, how do I, as an organizer, reach out to these people and say, your help matters? What is the most effective tool? Well, let me tell you, apathy means people don't care. And I, and I think you would agree with me. People care desperately. They care so much, they won't allow themselves to care because they don't want to be set up for disappointment. <laughs> you understand what I just said? They care so much that they won't allow themselves to feel or to hope, because if they hope, then what happens if it doesn't happen? I'd rather just say it's a lot more emotionally easy to say it's all corrupt, nothing's going to change, and, I, and I'm just going to have to deal with that. You understand, you understand what I'm saying to you? So um, having acknowledged that, your job is to give people a sense that things can be better. How do you do that? You got to talk to them. You got to be present in their lives. You're already doing that. You got to build relationships. You got to build trust. You got to put them first. You got to put them first. So while you got an excellent rap that you want to drop, you got to get that lady who has been serving coffee at that Denny's for 20 years, but she, but she needs, she needs to do something about her rent going up and her paying half her income in rent. So even though she's not confident about speaking in front of people, you, who, can, who are really articulate, you've got to figure out how to help her speak her truth. Because that is empowering to her. If you're willing to put yourself behind her and let her do her talking, but you're the one saying, okay, we're going to write it out, you're going to say it, we're going to practice it, it's going to go great. You know what I mean? Then she's going to stand up and she's going to do her little thing, and just the fact that she did it 
is going to make her feel really good. And all of her girlfriends who she plays bridge with are going to be like, you did what, girl? Wow, that's awesome. I'm so proud of you. And then they are going to want to be involved. Enthusiasm is contagious. Enthusiasm is contagious. So is being a downer. <laughs> but what I want to let you know is that if you want to organize people, you got to be the kind of person who's going to knock on 100 doors, and if you only get three people to come to the meeting, you're ready to knock on another 100 doors. You understand? Because I guarantee you, these things have a snowball effect. You first you get three, then you get another three, then you get it. Next thing you know, you're in a meeting and there's 5,000 people there. But you will remember when it was just three. You understand what I'm saying? You got to be kicking butt and fighting back when it's 32 below in, in Burlington and when it's 90 in Burlington because it gets to be both, doesn't it? I know because I'm from Minnesota. And so what I'm saying to you is that is what we got to do. But you've got to be one of those folks who believe in folks. And in the meantime, you got to do self-care. Self-care is really critical. I don't know what religion you are, but if you're a praying person, then you, you should pray. If you go to services, then go to them. Don't start thinking that's a waste of time. No, think of that as a recharge for yourself. If you're not religious, then go to the Green Mountains and just look at majesty of nature. You understand what I mean? Eat right, get sleep, work out, and then get back out there and do it. Thank you. Uh, last one. Um, so my question is really similar to the last question in that it's a small scale personal action question. Sure. Um, so Thanksgiving is coming up and I don't know if everybody's family is like my family, but I've got those like one or two uncles that hold these like conservative social Darwinist beliefs sure, like, sure. near and dear to their heart. And every year we get into a political debate at the dinner table and every year they're too stubborn to give it up or even listen what, to what I have to say. Mm -hmm. So um, I agree profoundly with everything you've been saying, but how do you go about talking to people who don't? Um, is there a way to change their mind? And if so, how do you do that? Well, um, I think it's important to know that um, sometimes family time is just going to be family time. <laughs> really, I, seriously. And I know you know, if you like to engage them in political discussion, by all means, you do that. But if you think that they're not going to ever change, then just be a great niece. You know what I mean? Because I'm a funny, funny thing about conservative people, um, they can be very compassionate. They just don't want to give, they want to give the donation themselves. They just don't want to give it through the government. That's what they'll say. And I'm going to tell you, 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 the seeds that you drop at, at that Thanksgiving dinner, they, they, might be, they might be on the job three weeks later and say, well, it's just like my niece said, you know, everybody ought to be able to go to the doctor when they're sick. But they might not say that to you. Why? Because they remember you as a baby. They remember they were, you were in a stroller. Now here you are going to tell them what's going on. Some of them don't want to hear that from you. You know, I mean, I, you know what I mean? But, don't, but just because you, they don't acknowledge that you're right in front of you on the spot does not mean they're not listening to you. So be a great niece, you know? Uncle, do you want some more turkey? <laughs> now back on this healthcare thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? But just remember that you don't have, that they're not necessarily going to agree right then, right there, but they may, they're listening to you. They're listening to you. And here's another thing. They're proud of you. They're proud of you. They're like, man, she's a spark plug. She really cares about people. She just, don't she remind you of Aunt Susie? Yeah, I, you know, really, I'm talking about real business here, okay? Because here's the thing about folks like, you know, conservative folks, and we all got them in our family. Everybody's conservative when they don't need something. When they need something, they get real liberal fast. You know what I mean? How many conservatives sitting up in the nursing home when their long-term care policy runs out and they got to spin down and get on Medicaid? Who knows what I'm talking about? Now, oh, you on Medicaid, huh, uncle? A Republic, conservative Republican on Medicaid, interesting. When I was in the state legislature, I had a bill to try to have a earlier medical intervention if a kid tested positive for lead. It was like 15 um, 
deciliters per, you know, per something, I don't know. And it had to get down to five. And even five does damage, but it does less damage than it high, as high as 15. I, was, I got ahead a bunch of Dems on there, but I couldn't get any Republicans on there. And then there was one guy who's a friend of mine, great, he's a Republican, he's a good dude, you know. He says, man, you know, this happened to my nephew. Put me on that bill. And I, I didn't say anything because I thought, you know, it ain't going to help me get more people on the bill if I'm going to be a smarty pants about it. But, but I thought to myself, man, does your compassion only run to your own family? And the answer is yes. But, but it does run to his family, though. So if you can relate it to something that they care about, oftentimes you can help them see that the government does matter. It is important. But on the other, at the same time, let me just tell you, you know, we got Republicans in Congress right now. One of them, you know, after that shooting that happened on the baseball field, and they're still like, oh, no, we can't, we can't regulate guns. I mean, what about just background checks? Just background checks. Nope, nothing. What about bump stocks? Can we regulate bump stocks? Nope. I'm like, wow, man, you, you know, y'all just got shot up on your, you mean nothing, nothing? I mean, so I believe that, I believe that, that, that once we really organize and really get out there, we're going to see a lot more people coming our way, even conservatives, because to tell you the truth, you'll talk to these guys in the gym and in the, in the lunch line and all this, and they'll sound like they agree with you, but then when it comes down to signing their name on the bill and voting, they don't want to do it. I mean, honestly, I, I'm, I'm looking for the day when... Uh, I don't need Republicans to become Democrats. I just need them to, to become uh, responsive to their own constituents. You know, just do what your constituents need. You, you can still say lower taxes and all that, but the taxes shouldn't be so low that if there's a hurricane, we don't even have the money to help people out of that, right? I mean, so I, I would just say that about it. You know what I mean? Just, and, and, and let me just say this about it. Most of the Republicans I work with are perfectly nice people. If they tell you that we don't like each other, that's actually not true. There's a lot of Republicans I'm friends with, think are great people. It's just that, like, I think, I don't need somebody to be related to me to want to help them, and they kind of do. <laughs> you know, so um, they'll, they'll give. They'll give a lot of money, but they don't want to give it to the government because they, oh, the government's going to waste my money. So, you know, it's, it's, they're not, we're not all the way we, after all, we're talking about our family members here, right? So I would say have a little comp patience and compassion. Play the long game with them. Look for points of you, that you can agree on. And then remember this. 90 million people did not vote in the 2016 presidential election. If they don't want to vote with us, there's a whole lot of people who do. Well, let's go get them. Thanks a lot, everybody.